Hello, and welcome to our Career Pathways panel, Exploring Careers in Fire and Paramedic. On behalf of the Saskatoon Industry Education Council, I would like to welcome you to our Career Pathways panel. We acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and homeland of the Métis, and we'd like to welcome students, parents, and teachers from across Saskatchewan who are joining us tonight. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank RBC Future Launch for sponsoring our Spotlight on Careers events. Their support is vital in making events like these possible. For the past two decades, the Saskatoon Industry Education Council has bridged the gap between Saskatchewan school systems employer and employers providing experiential learning and career development opportunities for Saskatoon and area youth. As a registered nonprofit, the Saskatoon Industry Education Council works in partnership with three school divisions and the Saskatoon Tribal Council, as well as community-based organizations, government agencies, and employers to help nurture the workforce of tomorrow. Last year, we worked with over 29,000 youth over 1,300 business and post-secondary representatives and more than 600 educators and career practitioners. We host over 40 programs and events every year, including our skills boot camps, which provide students with hands-on learning experience in various careers, our spotlight on careers, which are events similar to this that provide students with insight into different career pathways, our Connected event, which is a women mentorship program, which provides the opportunity for networking between high school females and women in our community, as well as the Summer Youth Internship Program, which is a six week paid internship where students can earn high school credits as well as a wage and um, hours towards their apprenticeship to start their career in the trade. We encourage you to visit our website or um, follow us on social media to stay up to date with our current program offering. At the SIEC, we feel it's just as important for students to find out what they don't want to do after high school as it is for them to figure out what they do want to do. So we do encourage you to utilize the Q&A function throughout our presentation this evening. Our panelists all know that you may have a lot of questions to ask. So please, if you have any questions or anything that you would like a particular um, panelist to address, or if you have a question for all of the panelists, then use that Q&A and we will get to those questions for you throughout the night. So we are going to start off. Um, so I'd like to thank the panel volunteers who are joining us tonight to share their career journeys. We're fortunate to have such great partnerships and have partners who are willing to share their time and their stories to help guide students through their career journeys. So first off, we have Matthew Murray. Matthew Murray has been with the Saskatoon Fire Department for 28 years. He is the captain of Two Pump Hall, which is made up of 10 members and spends his time covering in the role of battalion chief and assistant chief. He has enjoyed operations throughout his whole career and has spent most of that time at the busiest two halls in the city. Early on, he maintained and continually upgraded his EMT or emergency medical technician and was also a hazmat technician. Matt has enjoyed his career and to maintain happiness continues with ongoing education in the um, chance he finds another role he wants to pursue in the department. He has a wonderful wife who's a sergeant with the Saskatoon Police and two boys who presently attend the University of Saskatchewan. His hobbies and passions are continuing education, which he tries to teach his children, doesn't ever end. He believes nothing stops us from learning but ourselves. Other passions are hiking and tra traveling globally and trips back and forth to the mountains multiple times each year for hiking, snowboarding, or both depending on the season. Uh, he believes in taking advantage of every opportunity presented and a good book. So please welcome Captain Matthew Murray. There I am. Well, I guess that bio covered it, so that's probably good. No. Uh, yes, I started with the Saskatoon Fire Department 28 years ago, and it's one of those things where for me, it wasn't a childhood dream to become a firefighter. It just grew from a slow interest. I was in university dabbling at some classes at the time, had 
vague ideas of what I wanted to do, but not firm. I knew a firefighter and he said, it's a great job, you should try it. I thought, okay, I'll try that for a while. I'll come back to university later. And uh, I started, started right then to pursue, and again, we didn't have computers, or internet to Google this back then. I didn't know much about the actual fire department except what we saw on TV. But I found out that we had just, we, at the time, them, the fire department just moved into EMS, Emergency Medical Services. So I was told it'd be good to get your EMT ahead of time to help you get hired. So I was lucky enough to get into school for emergency medical technician, uh, took the course, really enjoyed it, really liked the concept of helping people, and of course, continued pursuing to get out of fire. Took a couple tries to get on. Uh, in that duration, I was lucky enough to get on to work with the ambulance as well to gain some skills on that side of it. And then finally got the phone call after applying, going through the testing, extremely awesome phone call to get when you work hard for something, you're looking at a goal, you work towards a goal, you obtain that goal. And it was a great day. And I was really lucky and happy to get hired with this job. Uh, from that point on, you just kept growing, developing with it. And, and, and as the more we did with this job, the more I realized how we actually make a difference. And we have found ourselves in a career of people helping, which feels incredible. And you never know what you're gonna enjoy doing until you start doing it. And again, I was very lucky to have fallen into this career and it's just turned into a passion and it's fantastic. Uh, on this job, like my bio said, got my EMT. I also joined the hazmat technician team, which is very interesting, dealing with dangerous goods in, this, in and around the city but Saskatoon Fire Department has many divisions in it and we do many calls. And like I always tell the new guys getting on the job to try everything you can with this job. So we cover fire suppression, we do water rescue, so we have a water rescue team, tactical rope rescue team, confined space rescue, structural collapse, threat rescue. Of course we do vehicle extrication, dangerous goods, like I mentioned. Uh, wrapping intervention team, which is there to protect us while we're at major incidents. We have educational programs we work where we're out to the schools and, and helping with fire stop programs and working with the elderly. It, it's just an amazing career where we get a lot of opportunities to help people in many different ways. Um, it's also flown by very, very fast. And 20 years later, worked through senior man into lieutenant, became a captain. Uh, and like the bio said right now, I spend a little time acting in the front office to help out and just to try new things. Because again, it's a great career with opportunities to try and learn as we go. Uh, lessons learned along the way, and this is number one lesson in life, is time moves by very swiftly. And you shouldn't wait for anything. If you want to pursue this career or any other career, hobbies, music, athletics, you just can't wait because time doesn't wait for us and we need to just find things, do things and get involved. And with, like I said, with this job, trying different specialties and divisions in this job, moving into an inspection branch for a while, an investigation branch, it's, these are opportunities people have. And as you refine yourself and try different things, it, it's, it's amazing to have more opportunities. Um, another lesson learned along the way, which is in life, is honest communication is essential at every point in life or in this career. It's hard to grow and develop together if you don't have the honest communication to grow through it. Uh, another lesson learned along the way is get in there and get dirty. And, and like I said, with life, don't sit on your hands, don't wait. If you see something and you want to pursue it, pursue it. Just don't make excuses not to, but get in there, get dirty. And that's especially important on jobs like this is when there's work to be done, there's work to be done. Everybody needs to get in and get dirty. Don't stand back when others are working. Get in there and you got to work harder than everybody else because your actions always speak louder than the words or anything else. Um, advice for somebody wanting to pursue a career in this field is it's not an office job and you need to approach it differently. Uh, there is time in an office, there's time on a computer, but uh, it's a very physical job and fitness and a healthy lifestyle are important, both 
for physically what we do on the job and as stress relief off the job. Exercise is excellent. Uh, as well, just even get hired on here, you need to go to fire college first now, mixed with we have a Saskatoon Fire Department physical abilities test, which tests you on specific physical skills and whether you're able to physically do the job on the tasks that we do. Uh, another consideration for someone wanting to pursue this career is you do get a second family out of it. it pros and cons to a second family though. So you've got lots of love, brothers and sisters, it's amazing, but you also get the drama that happens within a family. And for that, you sometimes need to develop a thick skin because you're gonna have conversations that are gonna be difficult. there will be good natured teasing, jokes, you're silly, but there will be critical criticisms of your skills if they're lacking. And you can't take that personally. You need to learn and listen and grow from it because it's a serious job and we deal with high stress, life and death situations. And when we train and when we work, we keep that reality in mind. So coming in, you need to understand that we do take our job very seriously and we play seriously to just keep the family environment going. So if you've got weaknesses before you get on the job, you need to work on them, whether it's strength, schooling, uh, any phobias, you need to work on those beforehand after the job. It's the same way if you have a weakness, always work on it to get better. If you need help, ask for help, but you need to always try and improve yourself to stay up to date. Uh, one more piece of advice for this career is don't lie, don't make excuses, don't try and deflect. You always have to be forthright, authentic, because we all make mistakes as human beings. We acknowledge it learn from it, grow from it, but this is a job that deals a lot with trust of each other. And yeah, it's, it's an amazing career. And just, if you want to pursue it, train, work and enjoy it. And thank you. That's all I've got for now. Thank you, Matthew. We do have a few questions that we um, could get you to answer right now, if you would like. So some, one of the students asked, where is the best place to get schooling for it and how many years? I will let Jeff answer that one when it comes up. He's more familiar with it. When I got hired on, we didn't have the fire colleges prerequisite that they do now. Uh, there's two, I believe, that we generally draw from. One is in Million and one is in Brandon. And I believe it's approximately a one-year course, which... I don't know if that includes your paramedic at the same time. Um, again, I'll let Jeff answer that one when he gets on. He'll be more familiar with that. Awesome. So we'll keep that one for Jeff. Um, someone asked, can a person who has asthma be a firefighter? Uh, as long as you can pass the physical abilities test. I guess it depends how bad your asthma is. But uh, again, it's a very physical job. And there are training for it. There's... there's I believe um, on the website, or there used to be, I'm not sure anymore, uh, some of the abilities you need to be able to perform, but it is a very physical job. So if it's debilitating, then it would be difficult. If it's a very mild form of asthma uh, and it, you can perform athletics with it, then that's a consideration. Uh, awesome. So Someone else must have liked what you said about the different teams you've worked on. So they said, how do you get on the special teams like diving once you're a firefighter? Those are some of the sought after ones you want to get on. And again, every, we go to everything, everybody's trained in multiple tasks to some basic level, but to get the higher technician level, you do have to join the teams. And a lot of it comes down to seniority after you've been on the job, like for the first few years on the job, you won't get an opportunity to be on the specialty teams because you're still developing your basic skills and learning our skill sets we're teaching you for uh, more direct operational training. But uh, yeah, the, the awesome skills, awesome technicians, and it's, it's just a great chance to do some amazing things, climbing like the, the high angle rescues well sought after because you're climbing down the sides of buildings, doing some pretty incredible things that you see on TV and our men and women here do it. it, it it's stellar. And the 
the water rescue program is well sought after. We've got a great team with both the surface rescue and the dive rescue. And I believe I'll let Jeff, if he wants to talk more on that afterwards too. All right, I'll ask you one last question. And then before we let you go, so how heavy are the hoses? That's a bit of a loaded question. When they have no water in them, they're, they're not too bad. Uh, you can grab a roll of hose. I think the medium size one, the two and a half inch, uh, is approximately, I, think, I want to say 60 pounds for a roll of it. But when you load these hoses with water, when we're making entry into the buildings, they become very heavy and uh, you're, you're wrestling. You're wrestling and you're working hard, so. Awesome, well, thank you so much, Captain Murray. And we will let you go. If people do have questions for Captain Murray, you can put them in the chat and, or sorry, in the question and answer. Um, and we will try to get to those later on when we have some more time for questions. So we're going to move on with our panelists. So next up, we have Carrie Servet. And Carrie has been working with STARS Air Ambulance as, in Saskatoon as a critical care paramedic. It takes many years to build an appropriate level of experience and knowledge to qualify for medevac critical care operation. In the past 27 years, he has been very fortunate to have had the opportunity in many professions that most would not. Kerry began his career as a ground ambulance EMT, um, known as a PCP or a primary care paramedic. Over the years, he's been working in many communities, accumulating a a multitude of experiences. Some of these larger areas he's worked in are Melfort, Regina, Moose Jaw, North Battleford, and Saskatoon. Kerry has worked with the Saskatoon Police Service as a teams or tactical paramedic for over 10 years and an RUH emergency alongside RNs and physicians in the resuscitation trauma area. During nursing shortages, Carrie was asked to work in the cardiac care unit and the intensive care unit for several months until they trained more nurses. In 2002, he began his medevac career with Saskatchewan Air Ambulance and has been in the most remote communities providing the highest level of care as a critical care paramedic. He also teaches new paramedics at the advanced level with a new program in Saskatoon called MedEV Education Program. Carrie's current role with STARS is a cell or a community education leader for Central and Northern Saskatchewan. So Carrie has quite the resume that I've just shared with you. So we are very fortunate to have him and welcome Carrie. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect, and I'll share my screen now then. There, how does that look? Good, so thanks again for having me. Um, uh, I could echo a lot of uh, what Matthew had to share there. I, I liked a lot of what he said about, about the fire service and it echoes a lot um, what, what the paramedic uh, lifestyle is like, being the uh, proactive person, asking questions, seeking out new learning objectives and and uh, not waiting uh, for somebody to come along and, and uh, you know, ask you to do something, but being a little proactive and getting out there and ask lots of questions. Don't be afraid to uh, make mistake, mistakes, but uh, kind of seek out resources uh, is what I've found has helped me along my career path. Um, so yeah, after you know, close, closing in on, on 30 years in the field, uh, I've had many great opportunities uh, that were listed there. Uh, and, uh, you know, those uh, I, I, I would call the, the highlights, uh, of course, uh, with paramedicine in Saskatchewan, it's changed uh, quite a bit. So uh, when I started, uh, it was um, a lot of on call, you would do 24 hours on call, um, and you would do calls and, and usually trips to the city. Most paramedics had to start out in rural Saskatchewan somewhere, and you ended up doing a lot of road trips. So that I, I knew early on that I wanted to progress and move into the bigger centers uh, and have higher acuity calls and more calls and utilize some of the, the training that, that I was 
uh, becoming passionate about. So I, uh, I put together a quick little uh, slideshow here that I'll share with you. And uh, I wanted to highlight a few things. Uh, the first one being uh, this, it, it's, it's nice now with uh, paramedicine in Saskatchewan that we're, we're a self-regulated profession, much like uh, nursing and uh, dentistry and optometrists and many others. Uh, but it's, uh, it's a great way to have uh, unity for paramedics in this province. And it's brought everyone closer together, I believe, and created a, an atmosphere where we can, uh, we can be a unified front and, and work uh, to progress paramedicine uh, in, in, in one unified direction. So that's, that's nice to have and the support from it. So uh, I put down there the link that you could access uh, and I would look into that if at all you're interested in, in what uh, paramedicine entails as far as licensing in the province. Um, it'll tell you everything you need to know from this, this website as far as where you can get your schooling. When I did the, the back in the day, the emergency medical technician, which is now known as the primary care paramedic, um, and even that's, that's upgraded from what, what I initially had. You know, it was an extension program. So I actually took it in Melfort, Saskatchewan. And we had an instructor come out from Regina and teach it there. And uh, it was about a month and a half classroom course. And then I had clinical that I rode along with paramedics on the street in Saskatoon, as well as a little bit of hospital time. I worked in the eMERGE for a couple shifts um, and that sort of thing. So uh, that was a pretty pretty quick program back uh, in 1993. I think I started that in September and I was licensed prior to January. I was working at a job in December. Uh, nowadays, that primary care paramedic program is, is less than a year and a half from when you start to when you're finished and licensed, you can, you can be working in about a year and a half. Uh, and that's the starting level um, in, in this province. Uh, so real, a real quick one here, my career pathway, I was lifeguarding and uh, a swimming instructor in high school. And that just led to actually calling 911 on a couple occasions. I would see the EMTs come in and, and take our, our individual off the pool deck that we had dragged out of the pool. And I thought to myself, well, maybe that's the next thing I should do. So I got into ski patrol. I did some volunteer firefighter training um, and I ended up working two years uh, in, in Melfort, Saskatchewan, uh, and you needed to work two years minimum to uh, apply to paramedic school. Now that's changed as well. You can go directly from your primary care paramedic program. And if you're accepted, you can go directly into an advanced care program right now. So uh, you can go straight through. I, I wouldn't recommend that. However, uh, I do uh, meet the odd student that, that has done that. And I find it much smoother and much easier transition once they get a bit of experience and things flow a lot, a lot better for the student that way. Um, I uh, was able to uh, get into paramedic training in uh, 97, graduating 98, and uh, then went to Moose Jaw for four years uh, with an ALS service there. That's the Advanced Life Support Service there. So they have paramedics on uh, uh, one working every shift there. So they, they're they able to call themselves an ALS service for that. Uh, in 2002, uh, till current day, I came to Saskatoon and I wanted to come here and fly with Saskatchewan Air Ambulance. So that's our fixed wing, our airplane in the province that's been here for around 75 years. And um, I love flying. I wanted to be a pilot and uh, but I also wanted to be home a little bit more when I when I was older and had my own family. So um, I stuck with paramedicine, and I'm I'm happy I I have. Uh, so and during that time, like was mentioned earlier, that's the thing about the bigger centers, your Saskatoon or Regina, or you get into your bigger centers, you have uh, sometimes more opportunity. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to uh, work in the hospital alongside nurses and physicians and learn an extraordinary amount of material 
uh, you, you can't help it but learn uh, when you step out of your scope of practice a little bit and see what's happening and, and the continuation of a patient, what happens after paramedics drop them off at the hospital. So that helped me bridge into the medevac, the critical care side, because I was able to work alongside a nurse in the CCU, that's cardiac care, and the ICU, uh, which serves me well today. Um, I was also able to get on with the Saskatoon Police Thames. That's the Tactical Emergency Medical Services. So that's where we uh, train with the police and we respond on high acuity type of calls. So any high risk type of calls that they might be serving a warrant on like drugs or gun related issues or uh, just if uh, street police staff come across an incident where they feel a little bit out outgunned or outmanned the the tactical team is called in so we would uh the we would attend with one or two thames paramedics with that team and deploy we had to train with that team and pass their firearm training as well so i have uh, been able to train with all their their uh, safety equipment and and weapons and and that sort of thing so that was uh that was an interesting uh 10 years and that's kind of a young man's game that one uh, Saskatchewan Air Ambulance, like I mentioned, I'm still flying with them, uh, but uh, I've uh, moved over to STARS working full time here and I still don't want to let go of that uh, fixed wing program, so I'm trying to stay there as long as I can as well. Uh, and I've also gotten into doing some instructing teaching at this new uh, program in Saskatoon anyway it's new. It's based out of Nova Scotia, but it's uh, through MediV see, and I uh, help out with instruction. When they when they need extra help and currently the uh the education lead and what that means is uh primarily i get involved in uh in education whether it's uh, virtual talks like this a lot of these sorts of things lately uh but primarily before covid i was uh, tasked with making sure all the volunteer and professional fire departments in this province had everything they needed in order to set up a safe landing zone for our helicopter and give them extra information as far as um, you know what's new what's changing with our equipment and how to handle that when we come in and uh, weather related issues and how to troubleshoot uh, a tight spot if if our pilots are finding an issue with landing so uh, so I uh, was coordinating that as well. Here's a quick picture of me at uh, Saskatchewan Air Ambulance and at STARS. Uh, so STARS started in 2012, actually, in this province. It uh, started in back in 1985 out in Alberta. But uh, the provincial government here wanted a helicopter provider for Medivac to complement the fixed wing. So uh, STARS and the provincial government came to an agreement, and we started flying in 2012 in Saskatchewan. You can see there the day photo and the night photo with the night vision goggles looking at the helicopter. So I'll talk about that in a minute. We respond in three different fashions. We do scene calls. We're linked uh, through, uh, there are certain criteria. If certain criteria are met when somebody calls 911, they bump it over to STARS and we hear about that call so we can respond to 911 calls as quick as possible that way. Um, we also do interfacilities. I think the stats lately are leading kind of more towards interfacilities. I think if you look at the stats for 2020, we're probably 60 40, 60% 60 are interfacilities. Someone may call from Nipwin, Humboldt, North Battleford, Lloyd Minster. Uh, and it might be a physician calling saying, I have, a, I have a sick patient. I've called RUH in Saskatoon and uh, we need this patient transferred. So the physicians are having dialogue. They're, we have a transport physician that's listening in, and then that transport physician will determine what's the most appropriate type of transport for that said patient, whether it's rotor wing, fixed wing, ground. Some of these patients, especially with COVID now, and when Regina and Saskatoon have gotten so busy, uh, I've heard I've heard more consulting and more uh, planning in keeping the patient at their home hospital if that can be managed. So it's great that STARS has and provides this transport physician service that's there 24 seven. That's a nice thing to have. It's a really good support. Here's just a couple stats uh, around uh, 
you know, there's Saskatchewan. I think it was two years ago we did uh, 812 uh, trips. So on average, in the three provinces, about eight trips a day over this number. The, the, this is old stats. So we're probably closer to 50,000 since uh, 1985. Just a couple quick things on this slide here. Uh, you can see our pilot. I just thought I'd throw that in there so you can see what the uh, night vision goggles look like. And that was uh, that was something STARS wanted to do and was successful with the federal government. These are a protected um, protected item, just as a narcotic is a protected item federally. These night vision goggles are, are deemed a protected e equipment. So they're very expensive. They could be considered a weapon. And so you we have to get a special license and only the pilots at STARS, once they're licensed, can actually have these in their possession. Um, so they are locked behind a, in a locked door and in a locked safe. Some That's just some information most people are unaware of. Uh, STARS is very safe. We always fly with two pilots in, in case something happens. Uh, and we always fly with a nurse and paramedic team. And uh, once you get hired on at STARS, that's when you go through what they call their academy. And it's, it's 20 weeks of pretty intensive training. And this is after, after the nurse or paramedic has uh, probably a minimum 10 years experience in their field. And uh, uh, you know the extra things you can do, like uh, I was lucky and fortunate enough with timing. There was a nursing shortage at RUH. I happened to be working with MediV here. I was, uh, you know, when as soon as they asked anybody that if they wanted to work in there, you, I put my hand up, let's get in there, really out of my comfort zone. I'm not a nurse, but yet I was functioning as a paramedic slash nurse in the hospital. So um, so it's, uh, it's pr a pretty intense uh, program, and I can, I'll add a little bit to that later here. There's just a new photo of our new helicopter we're running, and there's the range, uh, and the Cruising speeds 275 kilometers an hour at a range of 550. And we can put two patients in this machine, but it's pretty cramped. Uh, I haven't done it yet, not in that one. Um, we, uh, it was also a paramedic that decided, why don't we take blood to the patients? So we have an agreement with the uh, blood bank in Saskatoon and Regina, and we get fresh blood uh, three times a week. And if we don't use the blood on patients, it goes back into the blood bank and goes back into circulation. And so there isn't any blood that's wasted. So that's another thing that is, we were able to do here. Yeah, so that's that's all I have. I just uh, you know wanted to add to that uh, for for this service and other services, it's, it's, uh, it's a group and community effort. And uh, we couldn't do what we do without support from communities, fire departments, uh, and, the, and the paramedics that are in these ground units uh, throughout the province uh, and the communication staff for sure. So um, that's, a, that's a quick blurb about STARS and about my, my pathway to where I got here. Uh, and, uh, you know, I encourage anybody that's look, that is, would be interested in doing a medevac type of service, start building that uh, that rapport and start looking into in, into it because uh, there's lots of hiring and uh, they're looking for new people all the time and uh, you'd have to start somewhere so it started at that primary care paramedic level. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and sharing that information with you, with us. Um, I know you and Captain Murray both had a very similar message about the importance of lifelong learning in your career and taking any opportunity that does come your way, like you when you mentioned uh, when you put up your hand to serve as a nurse when there was a nurse shortage. And I just think that that's probably helped you so much in your career. And those um, words of wisdom are very important for the students to hear. Here as well. So thank you. And if people do have questions for Carrie, then um, we can get to those later on when we have some time for question and answers. So moving on, our next panelist is Marshall Carter. Marshall is a primary care paramedic currently practicing as an eMERGE transfer EMT in Saskatoon for Medivy Health Services West. 
Marshall entered the field of pre-hospital medicine in his early 30s, having previously pursued academics at the University of Saskatchewan, obtaining his Bachelor of Science in, with honors in toxicology and conducting research for the SASC epilepsy program under the Department of Neurology. Concurrent with school, Marshall was an assistant manager at Saskatchewan Alternative Initiatives, caring for intellectually disabled individuals. After much soul searching, he decided to combine his passion for biomedical sciences and serving those with unique needs into a career in EMS. Marshall graduated from SAS Polytechnic's PCP program in 2018, and during his so far short career, he has experienced the full gamut of EMS from working alongside nurses and physicians in hospital to coordinate transport and critical care services with stars and air ambulance. And of course, caring for people experience crisis of various kinds while working in an ambulance. Although the majority of Marshall's career has been spent in urban EMS, he trained and practiced in rural environments in the communities of Spiritwood and North Battleford before returning home to Saskatoon, where he currently lives with his wife and young family. So please welcome Marshall. Hi guys. Everyone can hear me, I hope. I'm assuming so. Nobody's waving at me. That's good. So uh, I believe I'm probably the panelist with the fewest years of experience. I cannot draw on my uh, decades to just come up with the words of wisdom. I had to record some things and put them down here. But uh, my intention through my portion here is to take you from being external to the pre-hospital medicine uh, area and EMS and all the way to PCP, where I am right now. So. Uh, the primary care paramedic or EMT is the entry level position in pre-hospital medicine, but uh, we are the largest field uh, of practitioners in Saskatchewan. I would hazard a guess that all the ACPs and all the CCPs combined in Saskatchewan or any province for that matter could not match the number of PCPs that are employed in any given province. In addition to that, most of the smaller centers are only staffed by PCPs uh, and are known as uh, BLS or basic life support services. I started school later than most. I graduated when I was 31 from SAS Polytech. Most of my colleagues were between 19 to 25 years old. They came either straight out of high school, perhaps with a year or two of university. But even given my educational background before that, school was difficult. The expectations are high, it moves very quickly. There's a lot to learn in the six months that you're in the classroom for. But as I did, if you study hard and commit yourself, you'll get far and you won't have any real problems as long as you keep on top of everything. After your classroom time is done, uh, you'll have about a four month practicum where you work as an apprentice, riding third on an ambulance with two seasoned paramedics, as well as an in hospital rotation uh, under a nurse. My advice to all of you up and coming EMS practitioners, ask all the questions and volunteer for every job you possibly can and you'll get as much out of it as, as, uh, as I did. It seems like a long time from the beginning of my training to entering practice took approximately 14 months and it seemed like an eternity, uh, but it went by in a flash upon further reflection. As soon as you get out of school, you will write the copper exam, the Canadian Organization of Paramedic Regulator, Regulators exam, which is a semi-national professional competency exam to just ensure that you know what you're doing and you paid attention in school and on practicum. Most of the provinces recognize it, uh, seven out of 10, if I'm not mistaken. And it's based on the national competencies and protocols that we're all responsible for is set out by the Paramedic Association of Canada or the PAC. After that, as my colleague Carrie mentioned, uh, you'll go through SCOP, the SAS College of Paramedics, our provincial licensing and regulatory board responsible for educational professional requirements as well as conduct and discipline. But their most important and primary role is deciding who and who cannot be a paramedic in the province of Saskatchewan. So, did your school, wrote your copper, got your license, now you get to go to work. There are three main pathways, which I'll go over real quick here, from the rarest to the most common. Um, I looked at the SCOP website this morning, there were 34 PCP job postings uh, as of approximately 11 a.m. 
So uh, the least common uh, with three postings is working in a clinic or a hospital or a northern nursing station or other health center. In that case, much like Carrie described, you're working alongside nurses or doctors or sometimes even on your own to do whatever function that facility is for. Um, in Saskatoon, for example, Prairie Harm Reduction uses a PCT, PCP to protect their clients uh, at the safe injection site as well as the BDU or the brief detox unit. They have a paramedic and nurse on staff to make sure that their clients are safe while they're suffering from the acute effects of alcohol or th from its withdrawals. During COVID, the paramedic uh, and the PCP have also been enlisted to help with both the uh, testing centers as well as providing immunizations and just generally in large to uh, assist in fighting the global pandemic. So uh, moving up on the scale of commonality, we have eight jobs listed this morning in the mines or the industrial sites. These jobs generally have pretty good pay and some pretty decent benefits. They require some pretty long tours up to several weeks at a time and can be quite remote at uh, fly-in sites where that's the only access. Uh, the call volume at these types of jobs is pretty low. You may only do like a couple of calls a year, but when you do, you're usually the only trained medical professional uh, on site managing you know, between dozens to perhaps 100 people. You won't really have any backup until they can be evacuated by Carrie and his service or by another Air Am service. Um, and in addition, because you have so much time and because very few people get hurt, um, you are usually given other duties like cleaning or being a security guard. Uh, so just make sure that you weigh that uh, when you go into an industrial or mining job. And then finally, the most common with 23 postings on Scott Peasant this morning, you get to work on car. There are two main divisions of this job, but generally everybody does a little bit of A, everybody does a little bit of B. So uh, first off is transfer car, used for taking patients already in the healthcare system from one site to another. This can be for a variety of reasons, um, either between cities entirely. Uh, when I was working in Battleford, I worked to take people from Battleford Union Hospital, typically to Saskatoon, but also to other centers. It can also just be in town, for example, from St. Paul's Hospital to RUH, as the hospitals each have different specialties, which they're responsible for. Transfer car is a pretty good way to get your feet wet as you are usually moving between two relatively controlled situations and someone with more training than you will probably have treated and prepared the patient for transport. Not always, but most of the time. You also get to cheat and read the chart, which is not something paramedics often get to do. We get to see the first half of the picture and then we deliver them to the hospital where all the magic happens. But uh, when you get to see that chart and you get to interview the patient in a non-stressful environment during a transport, you get to learn a lot about the ins and outs of diseases you may have only touched on briefly in school or rarely had the chance to encounter. So transfer car or T-car as we sometimes call it can actually be a great educational experience and a fantastic place to start. That's where I began my career. Finally, of course, there's working a merge or uh, working street, as we sometimes call it. This is the job that uh, it says on the tin when you think of paramedic. Someone calls 911, dispatch takes the call and then sends me or one of my colleagues. In this case, the special role of a paramedic in this setting is to be a medical transport expert. It's my job to assess the patient, come up with a treatment plan and transport them to a definitive care at a health center. I don't particularly like using the term saving lives. My job is to take an individual, keep them from getting worse, try and keep them stable. And if I can try and improve them, and then I take them from where they are to where they need to be in the safest and best possible manner. Although I can call for backup, uh, I can call a physician for medical control or for guidance. Me and my partner on an ambulance are considered independent practitioners, which means that we perform our duties without consult to a, a higher power, like you might find a nurse doing in the hospital. Uh, when we're called, we are called to gain control of a scene. This includes the patient, the environment, the bystanders that may be there, as well as coordinating the efforts of the other services. So between my colleagues in fire or STARS or first responders, uh, RCMP, police departments, all those are important aspects of any scene that we may be required to coordinate, especially if it's a medical call. When those people who are not typically involved with those medical calls are there first, like the police, um, when we show up and it is a medical call, everyone's head turns toward you and they are looking for you to take charge and move forward. Uh, one thing that I rapidly found out when I began my job is not all call calls are emergencies. 
most times people just want help with something. Sometimes I go to a call and I fluff someone's pillow. Uh, sometimes it's something completely different. In the space of two hours, I may go from doing CPR on an individual to moving to a woman who's depressed because her child has cancer. Then right after that, going to an individual who overdosed on meth. So it's, uh, it's really quite a, a random roll of the dice on any given day. Each call takes a different approach, but in all cases, you really have to maintain a compassion for your patient, uh, be calm, and finally, most importantly, be a good communicator. You'll see things that you would never encounter outside of this job, and you have to use those tools to be flexible enough to adapt to those situations and help those people, which is considerably harder than it sounds. Technical skills like IVs and med administration are great, but you do need the rock solid communication and assessment skills first so that you know what your patient needs as well as how to treat them. Days can be long. Sometimes you do no calls at all. Call this a shutout, getting skunked, depending on how enthusiastic you are. Sometimes you'll work for 24 hours straight and sometimes beyond that. Both are rare, uh, but the job can be quite demanding. Uh, occasionally we get stuck in a hallway at a hospital waiting for us to offload to a nurse at an overcrowded ER. And sometimes you may even have to take a bit of a hit and miss a meal or not get enough sleep. But you are responsible for being professional under extremely stressful situations, especially, uh, especially when everybody else is panicking. So my first piece of advice to you is to uh, take care of yourself. Independent practice means that you are responsible for keeping up your skills as well as keeping your equipment ready, but also checking in with yourself to make sure that you're okay. I, would highly recommend that if you do join this field, you keep, keep a hand in your non-EMS relationships just to remember what everybody else does for their job. And also just to be vigilant in regards to your mental health, because that is your responsibility and that is an increasing area of awareness, especially in my profession. Uh, once you get through PCP um, and you go through those three areas I talked about, you can branch off into other opportunities. Of course, uh, you can move up through the ranks into an advanced care paramedic or a critical care paramedic. Um, as previously mentioned, school becomes more difficult, longer, you get more tools, you get more fancy tricks and stuff like that. But uh, especially you're going to be looked to as a leader as you move up in those roles and your responsibility will increase. Generally, your opportunity as well in terms of jobs uh, will also increase as you get um, more and more roles. You can go on to become a community paramedic who is a person who brings the care to the patient in a non-emergent setting and treats them where they are so that they can stay home and avoid going to the hospital, especially for routine treatments. CPs, as we call them, generally have several years of experience and practice alone. Um, they're essentially the model of the physician coming towards your house. I won't pretend that a community paramedic is a physician, but they are able to reach out and take care of individuals in non-traditional places within the healthcare system and um, to sort of allow us to treat a patient in a more comfortable environment and perhaps even free up some resources by performing routine medical procedures um, at a patient's comfort in their own house. In addition to that, of course, you can go on to teach future paramedics. All my um, instructors at SIAST or SAS Poly were paramedics at one point in time. Most of the time you are going to be required to be a ACP to move on through an educational opportunity, but there are also educational opportunities for PCPs. Uh, you can also teach other paramedics who are already in practice um, through CPR or uh, ITLS or trauma course, uh, stuff like that. Um, additionally, you can go on to work for a regulatory body like SCOP. Uh, you can work with the Paramedic Association of Canada. You can have research opportunities, but these are farther afield than you would typically reach um, uh, diversifying your career opportunities in, as a PCP. Finally, if you stick with it long enough, eventually it's possible for you to own your own ambulance service and base. Uh, the person, my boss's 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 boss uh, used to be an ACP and now he runs, I believe, three uh, ambulance services across two provinces. So at the very tippity top of the management and administration uh, role, you can become the head honcho. In terms of mobility, it's pretty good. Um, in Canada, there's an expectation that almost everyone will have a paramedic be able to service that area. Of course, there are service gaps, especially in the north, but generally, most of the time, you can find a place to work as you move throughout the province. Moving between provinces can take a bit of extra training. There's definitely the expectation that you'll have to get a license uh, for a different province. 
you may have to take up a few extra skills, forget that you have a few extra skills, but uh, I have heard of many individuals moving from province to province relatively easily. I can't spe speak specifically to the requirements for any specific province, but uh, I know many people who've moved to Alberta or Manitoba and some to British Columbia. Uh, everything that the pre previous presenter said is gold in terms of um, advice. You have to get in there and get your hands dirty and just, just jump and go for it. Life experience will go a long way. You'll see a lot of crazy stuff. Experience gives you the wisdom though to deal with it. If you don't have any, because um, several people went in straight from high school and um, sometimes it's their first job being a paramedic. If it is, you'll get that experience very rapidly and that wisdom hopefully will come soon after. I've already mentioned it, but communication, not every call is an emergency, but almost every call requires you to interview, assess, and then to hand off to nurses and doctors. There are many different language skills you have to develop um, from talking to seniors, to talking to children, toddlers, parents, physicians, nurses, um, to hand off to an individual like Carrie who may intercept you at a scene. Uh, sometimes you have to sit with a person who just took a bunch of meth and sit there with them for like two hours. Uh, you need to know how to talk to that person. Uh, you need to be able to deliver the news that somebody in a family has died or passed away and be able to deal with the reactions that a person in the early stages of grief will have. So. There's many different tools that uh, go on your communication tool belt, but it is the one that you reach for on every call and the one that you need to take care of. Speaking of taking care of it, I've already mentioned it, but take care of yourself. This job can be stressful, but to be a good par paramedic, first you have to be good with yourself. Mental health is a huge issue in our field and it is your responsibility to recognize when you're going into a direction that you don't want to, that uh, you can recognize that and then pull up and make some changes. Um, if you, uh, can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your patients. And finally, just do it. Uh, I thought about being a paramedic for almost five years before I entered the field. Um, no one, not myself, nor any other panel member here can tell you what it's like to do this job. But uh, if you are interested, I highly recommend it. I you know, was very nervous. I still get very nervous sometimes, but I love my job. It's fantastic. The people who I work with and myself are highly trusted, highly respected in the community. And it's incredibly rewarding. Um, I will tell you that I've cried at work at least once in the three years that um, I've been practicing so far. But conversely, I have received probably dozens, if not a hundred uh, letters from patients who said that I made all the difference. Um, I go to work on a Tuesday uh, and for me it's Tuesday, but generally for most of the people that I see, they're having one of the more significant days of their life. And it's an absolute privilege and a responsibility to be able to serve those people, which is why I do it. I love going to work every day and uh, I wouldn't change a thing. Uh, those are most of my remarks and I'll answer some questions if you guys have them for me. Thank you so much, Marshall, for sharing those words of wisdom and also um, just talking about the different roles that you can have if you are interested in a career path um, in paramedic. Um, we do have a number of questions. I think some of them can be applied to both fire paramedic or what Carrie spoke about. Um, so I think we'll move on to our next panelist and then we'll leave the questions until um, the very end. And then if there's anything that you want to jump in on, then you're more than welcome then. So thank you. And we'll see you again shortly for our questions. So we are going to move on to our next panelist, um, Jeff Sanderson. So Jeff achieved his level one and level two firefighter at MESC in Brandon and started with the Saskatoon Fire Department in June of 2000. Since joining the Saskatoon Fire Department, he's participated in water rescue, dive rescue, and the technical rescue program. Recently, Jeff completed his chief training officer in 2020. So please welcome Jeff. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Um, it was kind of short notice, so bear with me. I'm not as well prepared as some of the other presenters. Um, so how did I get to where I am today? Um, I grew up on a farm near Keniston, um, taught swimming lessons, was a lifeguard of all things, and thought that was a pretty, pretty neat thing to do. So, um, after that, I kind of thought I want to be on the fire department. That was my goal from the time I was 15 years old. Um, asked about that when I graduated high school, and they said, we're not going to hire you at 18. 
go get a career, get a job, go to school, do something else. So I attended university, uh, got a Bachelor of Arts in Physical Education, went back to the fire department and said, I want to get a job. What do I have to do? And they said, go to a fire college. So then I ended up going to Manitoba, um, to Brandon for the MESC for about a 10 month course. Uh, it's a good, good school. And it's like all the other courses that you take, it gives you the basics. It gives you some place to start, but you have a lot of learning to do once you get that first training. Uh, since I've been on the fire department, I started out with the EMT, uh, was in the hazmat team, water rescue, dive rescue, and the technical rescue, which involves high angle, confined space, trench rescue, uh, HUSAR, so for collapses, building collapse, and vehicle extrication. Each one of those things is um, quite involved, but worth every, every bit of effort that it takes to do it. Um, some of the lessons that I've learned. So it's been, it's been a, a good career. Things I've learned, girth, good work ethic will never hurt you. Um, sometimes what you lack for in experience or lack for in knowledge, hard work makes up for a lot of that. Bring a good attitude to work and to life in general. No one wants to be around the, the person that's always grumpy or complaining or sad. Um, if you can bring a good work, uh, bring good attitude. Your job is what you make it. If you if you make it a good place, it'll be better for you. Um, lessons on the fire department. Uh, every uh, the job is very dynamic. It changes every day. It was supposed to be Nate Husalak that was sitting here with you tonight uh, at about five o'clock yesterday. I found out it's me. So it changes and it's good. It's not a boring, boring career like all the other emergency services. They're the same way. Everything changes. Um, when people aren't sure who to call, it ends up on the fire department's phone line. Uh, every day is different and you never know what you're going to get. And you end up with lots of all the training that you get is great, but you're never ready for the unexpected calls that people don't know who to call. Um, and like all the other emergency services, there are days that are pretty tough. There's hard days, but the uh, the good days way outweigh that tenfold. So just be prepared that not every day is is the one that you're is a good day. You see lots of bad things. Some days are rough that way but the good days are way better. And the lessons, teamwork. Um, every day you're on a truck, you're working with other people. And like Matt had talked about, it's like a family. Brothers and sisters fight, they argue. It's no different on the fire department. You gotta learn to get along with each other. Someone might criticize you, take it for what it's worth. Maybe look at yourself, realize that they were right. You knew you need to do something different. They got to look at it the same way. If someone's doing something that's not right, you might have to give them criticism. Uh, obviously, you have to be do it correctly. Can't be uh, can't be rude about it. Some of the advice for people wanting to have a career in the fire department: any age, any education you can get is helpful. You never know where it takes you. Um, when I was in high school, I thought, "Why do I need chemistry? I want to drop it. It's terrible." Uh, my teachers wouldn't let me do that. They said no. Turns out I needed chemistry to get into physical education at university. So it was a pretty good, good thing that they didn't let me drop that. Um, and remember, education isn't just going to school. Um, every experience you bring, you bring something to the call. So if you're a farmer and you know the grid roads, that'll help if you're going out on a, on a country call. If you're an electrician, if you're a mechanic, if you were a carpenter, if you worked as a laborer jackhammering concrete and you end up on a T4 team in a, a collapse building, that'll be something that's very helpful. So everything you do follows you. Um, all your past jobs, everything you do from the time you're in high school on will affect where you get on. Your driver's abstract. Uh, if you don't show up to work at your job at McDonald's or it follows you and it'll affect your ability to get on to whatever career you want to do later on in life. Um, that was pretty much it. That's my short, the short version. So if you have any questions, I can, I can answer them.
Thank you, Jeff. Um, we do have one question that was, someone had posted and they wanted to know, do you stay at the station for work 24 seven? So in Saskatoon, we have, um, we have shift work. So we work two 10 hour days to 14 hour nights. So we work from eight in the morning till six at night for two days. Then we work from six at night till eight in the morning for the two nights. We have two days off. Then we do the same thing, the two days, the two nights and have two off. So it's four on, two off, four on, six off. And when we work the nights, yeah, you're here all night. Um, there's one other question about, um, and I know you talked a little bit about how everything you do can impact your career. And then someone asked where in Saskatchewan are there current volunteer opportunities for fire or um, PCP, or sorry, CCP? Uh, I can't ask, well, I, I can't answer the CCP part, but for fire departments, every small town has a volunteer fire department. Um, close to Saskatoon, Warman, Martinsville, Delmany, uh, Hanley, Caniston, Dundurn, you name it, they all have all have a volunteer department. And I have Carrie or one of the MetaB people can probably answer about the EMS all right. stuff. Um, are there ever any volunteer um, opportunities with the Saskatoon Fire Department? Uh, no, not for the, no, not as a firefighter, there's not. All right, and so we do have um, some other questions in the Q&A, but we'll get to those when we get, uh, when we have our question and answer at the end. So thank you so much hey. for joining us and we will see you again shortly. Thank you. So we are going to move on to our final panelists of the evening. We have Pamela Buchert, who is a med emergency medical communications dispatcher with MediV Health Services West for just over 10 years. Pamela is also a captain on the Clavette Fire and Rescue Volunteer Department for 14 years and a volunteer medical first responder with the Saskatchewan Health Authority for 13 years. So I think she might be able to answer some questions about volunteer opportunity. She is involved with the Saskatchewan Volunteer Firefighters Association Critical Incident Stress Management for three years, as well as a peer support team with MHSW with training in CISM, R2MR, and individuals in crisis, group crisis, crisis in the workplace, and a member of the International Critical Stress Foundation for two years, recently completing the Wounded Warriors Beyond Operational Stress. Pamela has provincial certified training in vehicle extraction, pump operations, and wildland fires. She is the Village of Quebec's Emergency Management Organization Coordinator, and she's completed the Saskatchewan Public Safety Agency ICS Incident Command System 100, 200, and 300. As an emergency medical dispatcher, she's been a member of the International Academies of Emergency Dispatch with advanced certification in good standing for 11 years. So please welcome Pamela to our panel this evening. Hi, everybody. Thank you to all of the other panelists that have already spoken. Um, it's nice to be included. Oftentimes, medical or communications are left out of these kinds of panels. And it's interesting for students to wonder who actually answers the call when I phone 911. So at Medivy Health Services West, we're known as a secondary answering point. Your primary answering point is Saskatoon Police. So they'll find out if you need uh, police, if you need medical communications, or if you'll need the fire department, and they'll transfer your call accordingly. Um, our center has been an accredited center since 2000. An accredited center means that we have a very high compliance of 95% on all of our calls, uh, meeting our times and uh, assisting our, our patients or our, our uh, ambulance services. Um, Regina just received their accreditation this last fall. So, you know, we've uh, got 20 years on them there for being, being accountable and holding that 95% um, professionalism. We uh, dispatch for 39 ambulance services in Saskatoon. Uh, we're called the Medical Communications Coordination Center, Central, 
And so there's also one in the north and there's one in the south. Um, at our center, we have again, 39 ambulance companies. We go as far south as Beachy, as far north as Black Lake, as far east as Foam Lake and as far west as Kit Scotty, um, which is done by Lloyd Minster. So um, imagine that area, Google it later. It's a significant part of the province. We average about 300 calls in a 24 hour period. Um, when I first started about 10 years ago, we used to celebrate when we hit 100 calls and went, woohoo, we're in the triple digits. But you know, now we're, now we're brushing 300 calls every 24 hours. So it's really, really increased our call volume without adding any emergency service companies. That's the same 39 services that we had 10 years ago. We also dispatch for medical first responders. Somebody had asked, how do you become a PCP volunteer? Well, the Saskatchewan Health Authority has a program called Medical First Responders. They're a step up from a first responder, but they don't have the same requirements as a basic life support paramedic. You don't have to write your copper, and that's a volunteer position. And we dispatch for about 200 of those services in Saskatchewan. So as an example, if you don't live in the city of Saskatoon and you're in one of those um, areas outside the city of Saskatoon, like myself, I live in Quebec. We have a first responder group here that if there was a medical call, we would go and offer medical assistance until the paramedics could, could arrive. Uh, same thing with the volunteer fire departments. They're everywhere in Saskatchewan. Um, Saskatoon, Prince Albert, um, and Regina are the only three fire services that have paid positions. Uh, places like Swift Current and Melfort will have, or Humboldt will have a couple of positions that are paid and the rest of the department are made up of volunteers. So if you're looking at volunteering in any of the areas, you, you have to go outside of the major centers. With medical communications, as I mentioned, we have 39 ambulance companies and 300 calls. So it really keeps you hopping. Um, every time you pick up the telephone, you never know if it's somebody that's fallen down and need a help up, or if you're going to be uh, doing CPR on a child or um, dealing with somebody that's choking. And with the 300 calls that we're dealing with in the 24 hour period, it's uh, an enormous, um, amount of, of calls. You, we only have so many seconds to be on the telephone with somebody to get the determinants to put it through to the ambulance so that they can start driving. And our, our time to, to dispatch an ambulance to get an address, a telephone number, a chief complaint, and have an ambulance rolling is 60 seconds. So when you call 911, it really helps out if you actually have your address and telephone number memorized so that, that you're not delaying help and we can continue to make our, our times. Um, how did I get into 911? I started off life not knowing what I wanted to do and kind of went from job to job. And I joined the Clavette Volunteer Fire Department in 2008, became a medical first responder in 2009. At the time I was working an office job, I was doing uh, accounting, payroll, and um, order entry at a company. And I found that I was much more excited to go home and have my tones dropped on the radio and respond to calls. And I thought, I need to do a career change. I need to do something that makes a difference. And so I looked into becoming a paramedic. And on the web page where I was looking at MD Ambulance, which is what it was called at the time, I saw this little area called communications and I thought, oh, what's that? And so I looked into the requirements for community uh, communications and I went to the International Association Emergency Dispatch. I signed up for one of their courses and I waited for the next hiring process at communications. Thankfully, I was able to get on right away and uh, start my career. And this is the longest job I've ever held. I've been here for over 10 years because every day is a new day and you just never know what you're going to experience. Um, something that hasn't been touched on yet tonight, I don't think, is that communications as well as Saskatoon Fire and paramedics are all union positions. So one of the nice things about that is you um, um, have your, your union backing, your standard pay and and those kinds of things if that's important to you 
Um, somebody had also mentioned in one of the questions about what do you do with people that um, speak a different language? Well, um, as we have multiple services in the north as well as in Saskatoon and um, Onion Lake, we have uh, a language line interpreter that we can use. We also have a lot of people that come to Canada where English is not their first language. And so um, it's, a, it's amazing how you can figure stuff out and you can pick up some different words, but we also do have a language line interpreter if, uh, if that needs to happen. Um, we, somebody had talked about uh, shift rotations. So in Medivy, um, for paramedics as well as comms, we follow the same shift rotation. We work 12 hour shifts and it's on a 554 rotation, meaning we work um, five shifts. We have five off, we have five shifts, four off. So you're guaranteed two weekends off a month. And we usually work um, two days, two nights, three days, two nights, and then uh, two days, three nights. So it, it rotates that way with a little bit of a, a break in between. I think that's about all I had for communications. Um, like the fire service mentioned, it's uh, definitely a camaraderie. It's something that you get into because you wanna help um, to keep in line with the accountability. Something you really need to know is to, to take it on yourself. I live by the motto, if it is to be, it is up to me, which is why I have my hands in a lot of different piles because no matter what I do, I, I like to make a difference. Thank you so much, Pamela. Um, we do have one question that pertains to the volunteer firefighting and they ask, do you have to be 18 to be a volunteer firefighter? you do have to be 18 in the province of Saskatchewan to be a volunteer firefighter. Sometimes they will allow a student position and those just require a little bit more uh, paperwork and accountability on the department's behalf uh, and it's for insurance purposes. Awesome, well, thank you so much. And so at this time, I'm going to invite all of our panelists back um, with us. And we do have a number of questions that I would like to address with the panel. And if anyone in particular wants to jump in, just let me know. So someone had asked, where is the best place to get schooling for fire? fighter and um, how many years. And so I know um, I did put in the chat that one of our, um, one of the things that we have done this month for our spotlight on careers was we created a video series with Saskatchewan Polytechnics Paramedic Program, as well as Lakeland College's Fire and Emergency Services Program. And so um, those videos were with their recruiting agents that will talk about the application process as well as um, as the actual programs themselves. Um, someone had asked what classes you need to work for Saskatoon Fire, but I may be answering for Jeff and Matt, but I think that that would be not necessarily what classes you need for Saskatoon Fire, but what classes you would need to either apply to Brandon or to um, Lakeland College. Is that correct? Yeah, for Saskatoon, you'd have to graduate from one of those colleges to get in here. Um, I think you have a couple different options. Uh, the 10 month, if you take the 10 month course, you'll come out with all the stuff you need. If you take the three month course, you have to keep going back multiple times to get all the classes that you need. So. And do both um, schools offer the 10 month course or is, does one offer the 10 and one offers the three? No, I think you can take the both. You have to make sure that you get your paramedic as well. So uh, I believe if you go to MESC, you'll get both. If you go to Vermilion, you have to take your paramedic PCP separate from the, from the fire course. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Um, with both fire and paramedic, are there height and weight um, there requirements? With fire, no height or weight issues. You just have to pass the physical abilities tests that we have. With paramedic, are there any certain requirements that you need to meet? I can't speak to uh, Carrie's experience on uh, aircraft, but there are no height and weight requirements to my knowledge either. 
once again, as uh, Matthew alluded to, you have to pass the physical. However, there's not a day that passes on car where I'm not jealous of my slightly shorter colleagues who can stand up in the ambulance. I'm 5'10", and my head will hit literally everything in my truck. So um, sometimes it's better to be slightly shorter in this job. I don't know. I don't know if I'm still on here, uh, Michelle. I I can't get my video. I think it's blocked. But uh, anyway, um, yeah, I can speak to the 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 aircraft part. There is no height or weight uh, restrictions here as well. Different different uh, ground ambulance uh, services. I know uh, sometimes have their own. Um, uh, physical assessment that they'll do like the fire departments have their their rigid uh you know strict physical some of the service the ambulance services will incorporate something into their hiring process awesome well thank you so much for answering that question for us um there is a few questions here that i think could kind of go together so one says what age do you mostly get hired at um, is it better to go to school right after high school or take a year off? And what can you do in the meantime if you're still young and like to start learning, but you're under 18? Uh, I'll touch on that one, I guess. It's, we've hired people, the youngest we hired was just under 19. He was 18 when he got on. Uh, one of the oldest ones, I think, was one of my classes way back when, and mid 30s, so I want to say 35, was one of our oldest we hired. The average age is young 20s, 20, used to be around 24 was the average age we hired at ballpark. And, and part of it was what Jeff touched on with that is it's good to have experiences outside of the fire training because you're going to get sent to fire college anyways. You're going to get that particular skill set. But like Jeff touched on as well, it's nice to bring something else to the equation, whether you're a mechanic, whether you're a carpenter, whatever you bring in ahead of time, whether you've got some other education skill sets, it, it's good to bring because with all these emergency services all working together, we show up to a scene every time and, and me never is it the same scene. Like you got may go to MBC, like a motor vehicle collision or you may go to someone having a heart attack, full cardiac arrest, no matter what the situation is, whether it's the atmosphere, the, the call, the situation, it always changes. So to have some previous experience at a life skill is amazing. And I, I just, like I said before, just get out there, do things, experience life, um, improve yourself. If you find weaknesses with yourself, work on those weaknesses, be the best you can be, and then go for it. All right. Uh, the next question, I'm going to throw this one to Marshall. Uh, or sorry, no, um, Jeff, for this one. Do I have to get my EMT certification before I try and become a firefighter? So for Saskatoon, uh, the require, minimum require, requirement is uh, your EMR, but basically PCP uh, is your best bet. Um, EMR is kind of the minimum standard, but for the most part, we hire PCPs, so primary care paramedic, um, to be on here along with your, your uh, NFPA 1001, 1002 that you get at Brandon or Vermillion. Thank you. So sorry, the question I had for Marshall, um, how long does it take to be a paramedic with full experiences? Oh, that's a loaded question. The word full experience is, <laughs> I don't know if I've ever met a paramedic with full experience. I strongly believe that's the day you quit. It's when you've seen it all. Um, as I previously mentioned, I started school in July of 2017. I had graduated in April of 2018. So that's almost a year right there. I waited two months to go write my licensing exam and I was licensed soon after. I was working in an ambulance in October. So that makes it a year plus approximately three, four months after that. There is a possibility of you going restricted as it's called, which means that you're operating under the license of another fully qualified paramedic. Um, some services do hire those and you can get into that as soon as you have finished up your school but before you write your licensing exam or the copper. Um, 
I would generally say that having been there for three years, I still feel very fresh and very new, but uh, it's all a matter of perspective. You will be nervous. You will make mistakes as long as you just kick your little feet, keep going and uh, try to learn from everything that goes wrong. And then you will be that fully qualified paramedic, regardless of the number of years under your belt. Thank you. Um, here we have a question that anyone can jump in and answer, but it says, is having a weak stomach when it comes to blood an issue? I think everyone will answer <laughs> yes. I, I thought I knew the answer It's not the, the end of the world, one, but, but you, <laughs> you'll get used to some different sights and different smells. No matter which, which one of these careers you're in, you'll see things and smell things that you're not probably used to. I know in our event last night with um, the police and RCMP, they talked a lot about um, eyesight requirements. And so we have a question here. Um, will ha having a lazy eye affect anything or is there any type of eyesight requirement for either fire or paramedic? Uh, for firefighting, there is minimum eye requirements. Uh, you would need to get an eye exam before you get on with it. I believe it's, and I don't remember exactly, but I do believe it's 2030 uncorrected and 2020 with corrected, so. There's requirements for communications as well. You need to pass a hearing exam as well as uh, an eye exam. So same thing, um, even if you do have a hearing impairment, as long as you have a device that allows you to be able to pick up the uh, required sounds and same thing with the visions because you're dealing with uh, multiple monitors, you need to be able to have a uh, corrected vision. Ground ambulance. The, to, oh, sorry, please go ahead, Carrie. That's right. Uh, I was just going to say, I think for, for the paramedics, you know, you have to be able to maintain that class four driver's license, which would mean the medical and you, if you need uh, corrective vision for that, you you need to be able to pass that uh, eyesight test with your family physician to get that license. Do you have more, more than that to add, Marshall? No, the class four license, I think, is uh, the, the standard that we all kind of follow. There is a possibility if you have an issue getting a class four license, you can go to work at a stationary position as a paramedic in one of the other roles that I had mentioned. But uh, if your dream is to drive an ambulance and go fast and do the sirens and all that, then you need your class four, which means relatively decent eyesight. Um, Pam, we have a question for you. What training do you need before you can apply to communications for MediV? So at MediV, we're an accredited center, which means you have to have your qualifications through the International Association of Emergency Dispatch, the IAD. And that certification you have to do, it's a, a three-day course, which doesn't sound like much, but let me tell you, your in-house training is an eye-opener. And uh, it's an experience that, that you won't regret if, if you go through it. Thank you. And I think we have one last question we'll get to. And this one asks, how many people apply to firefighting a year in Saskatoon versus the job avail jobs available? That's kind of a tough question uh, because we have jobs available depending on retirements as they show up. Uh, the last few years, we've been actually hiring a lot more people because of an age group of people that are retiring and some of us are getting a bit older. So yes, <laughs> we end up going. Um, yeah, we have, I can't recall the numbers off the top of my head, but there are large volumes of people applying for sometimes very small jobs. Uh, part of that is because it is an amazing job. Um, one of the things to consider though, is to go on the city of Saskatoon website and we often have open house nights. So you can actually check where the open house is and that's a good chance to you get to come to a fire hall. Uh, there'd be officers, community relations people, chiefs, firefighters, and you can ask questions, talk, walk around, look at equipment. And yeah, it's just a good opportunity to get more one-on-one -on -one information and meet the people and meet and greet. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an amazing career. But if you, even if there's a lot of people applying, that's what I'm saying about just fix your weaknesses, get your skill sets up 
And it doesn't matter how many people apply, just make yourself the best every time. Awesome. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this evening. Um, you all brought such great experience to the event and I know you're able to answer most of the questions that the students had. Um, with, I guess, one final thing, um, with Saskatoon Fire, with MetaV, is there any type of resource available that if kids or students did have further questions about pursuing a career in that area, is there anything that they can access or an email that they can contact to ask those specific questions? I'll touch on that first, yes, yes. Even on the City of Saskatoon website, there's a contact number as you can get. There's more information in our community relations division um, will happily answer any more questions, work with you. They set up different times for events. Uh, and there's, I believe there's multiple numbers which go through our, like our dispatcher panel there. We have a central dispatch system as well. Uh, they'll answer it, they'll transfer you where you need to go. Is there anything with MetaV if, uh, if students did have questions about careers in that area, is there any type of contact that they could reach out to? In Saskatoon, yep. our non-urgent line is 975-8800, uh, but they can also go to the MetaV Health Services West webpage and there should be a link on there for training. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I know that um, we did go a little bit over time, but you guys all shared such a great information. And I can see that there are students still tuned in. So you kept them entertained this whole time and you provided great insight into the careers that you've all had. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, before people do log off for the evening though, I will uh, just say a few thank yous and go through a few little housekeeping items. So thank you to our partners for putting this together, MetaV Health Services, the Saskatoon Fire Department, and SARS Air Ambulance. Um, without their fantastic partnership, we wouldn't be able to bring this career exploration event to students like you this evening. Thank you to our panelists who gave their time to be part of our event and share their stories with you. I'm, I know I learned from all of them and I'm sure you guys uh, were able to take away a lot of important information from our evening tonight. Thank you to our partner school divisions, Greater Saskatoon Catholic School, Saskatoon Public School Division, Prairie Spirit School Division, as well as the Saskatoon Tribal Council for partnering with us for events like this. And thank you to your teachers who encouraged you to participate in our event this, uh, this evening. Uh, thank you to my colleagues in the office who helped to put these events together and especially Erin Adair, who's been behind the scenes helping me since my computer glitch at the beginning. I sent him an emergency SOS text to back me up and make me look good. So thank you, Erin. And thank you to everyone for tuning in this evening and giving your time to um, explore your future career path. If you do have further questions, um, please let us know. But one thing I do ask of anyone who tuned in tonight is to give us some feedback. We would love to hear what you thought of our event this evening um, and just tell us what we can do to help you with your career journey in the future. And so any Students who participated, please fill out, uh, we have a quick little QR code with a uh, feedback survey and also any teachers who may be accessing this, we ask that you just take some time to um, give us some feedback so we know where to make improvements or changes in the future. And finally, stay connected. Maybe tonight you learned that you have a weak stomach and so fire and paramedic isn't for you. Um, there are many different areas in emergency services. So check out our website for some other resources we have available. And then also stay connected with us to find out about um, our events that we offer in different areas. So each month throughout the year, we focus on different sectors. So you can see on the screen what we've covered so far. Um, all of the events, like our event tonight, are recorded, so if there's something that you see on the screen that may be of interest to you, uh, check out our website. You can check out the recordings. Of course, they're not as great as the live event, but it does provide you with some information about those career paths. 
And finally, best way to stay up to date with us is to follow us on social media or give our YouTube channel um, a subscribe so that you can see all of the live events that we record. We post them on both our website and on YouTube. So follow us on there and you can see all the great things that we have going on. So thank you so much for joining us this evening and we hope to see you at our events in the future.